Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Mark, so good to have you back, man. Thank you, sir. Well, so I uh, want to talk a lot about reaching people in this sort of new era. Right. And I like what you say. You say, I'm from the future because you and I are both Canadian, yeah. right? Yeah. When do you think Canada became post-Christian? Because in the argument yeah. here, yeah. Most, most listeners are American, yeah. viewers are American, is, is that America is rapidly becoming post-Christian. Yeah. I would argue, and feel free to disagree because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we have a lot of time. Mm-hmm. We're good friends. Mm-hmm. We can disagree, yeah, sure. still be friends. Sure. I would argue that America accelerated its post-Christian trend during the pandemic as people change their habits. I just read something this morning, actually, that says 59% of people no longer plan to renew their gym membership. And we know from Barna that one in five people who used to go to church checked out of church in the first year of the pandemic, et cetera. So here we are, you know, year and a half into this thing. And, uh, America is becoming more post-Christian. When do you think Canada became post-Christian? Yeah, it's an interesting uh, question. Mark Nall wrote a book years ago um, called Whatever Happened to Christian Canada? And it's a very thin wow. book, but it'd be helpful for viewers, people listening to be able to go. Because our whole kind of conversation about that is like, if Canada kind of reached that post-Christian scenario, um, you know, and we're trying to reach people in it and being somewhat effective, who knows how you gauge that, there's principles that we can use for people in the States to go like, here's the kind of thing that's working or not working to reach these people in this scenario. Right. So anyway, so Nall talks about the idea that like, so he points out something crazy. So in Quebec, which I'm not sure all the viewers or listeners would totally know, but that's the French part of the French province of Canada. Uh, I think it's the second most populated province in the whole country. Yeah, it is. There's like, I don't know, six, 7 million people in Quebec. Right. So um, it, it used to be, one of the highest per capita religious places on planet Earth. Yes, okay. it was completely Roman Catholic. Completely Roman Catholic. So the, the Jesuits ran everything. The priests yeah. ran everything. So that's in like let's say the fifties. Yeah, forties and the fifties. It was per one of the most religious places on the earth. Now, fast forward to 2020, 21, it's one of the least. Like we're talking Deeply like secular. the same levels of Saudi Arabia, I think Mark Nall <laughs> points out per capita yeah. of like yeah. Christianity or something, you mm-hmm. know? So it's it's gone through this kind of change and that kind of secular impact has gone across Canada for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but I think that's partly what happened in Canada. I think you have, you know, the flurry of things people talk about, you know, whether that's the distrust of institutions in general that came out of the 60s um and sexual revolution and tech revolution and uh you know all kinds of different revolutions that have happened that have created this distrust of authoritarian you know and there the church would have had power right so you know in some cultures it's like i'll become a christian become part of the church as kind of the counter religion you know the counterculture Mm. in that context it'd be, be to become part of the power and so I think, you know, as we've talked about before in, 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 you know, it's like Christianity, power is the place Christianity goes to die. It works best on the margins. It works best among mm-hmm. the people who aren't seeking after power. That's why it's growing in Asia and Africa and Latin America and so on. It's, it's where it doesn't have political power. It's, it's where people have to fight for it. So anyway, so uh, that's, I think, partly probably what happened. And, uh, and now here we are. And so, but it's not totally hopeless. People... You've seen people coming to Jesus. Oh, yeah. We've seen people coming to Jesus. People are interested in these things, and so there is hope. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting to me because I think you can see it happening in strata in the United States. So, for example, the coasts, particularly New England, the Northeast, New York City, and then the whole left coast, would be definitely more post-Christian sure. than, say, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, mm-hmm. uh, that sort of thing. But if you're in the Bible Belt, you see it generationally. Right. You will see that the boomer parents, grandparents are Christians, but the Gen X younger millennial kids or Gen Z 
sure. uh, younger millennial kids, they're like, no, I really have a different viewpoint of the world. So you minister in Vancouver, BC. You've grown a church to well over 5,000 people now who call your church home from scratch, started at your house. Uh, and a lot of those, you know, you get, you're definitely, definitely have some consolidation where people used to go to other churches now go to your church, but you've seen a lot of conversion growth. You've done thousands of baptisms. You've seen many, many, many decisions for Christ. What would you say are the characteristics of post-Christian culture? Cause you and I just filmed a course called the art of better reaching mm. and you do a couple of units on like the characteristics of post-Christian culture. So right. just highlight that for us. Yeah. Well, I think, I think there's a, a plethora of things. I think you have people who uh, have become um, spiritual but not religious, um, have, have, have really leaned in on this, the psychology um, of self-actualization versus theology or philosophy. And so it's like we become pop psychologists. You go into any bookstore, what's the best-selling section bar none? Hmm. Self-help, right? Uh, and so you have people who are into themselves, into self as a priority, and that's what we're kind of speaking into is this, you know, as Keller shared on, on your podcast recently, um, you know, if he was planting again in New York City, he would, he would preach about identity a lot. And the reason yeah. is it's because people, that's, people are into this kind of autonomous individual, who am I? Uh, you know, where am I, what is my place? That's why the Enneagram I think right. is popular, right? It's like, what's my personality pro portfolio and what, and wh how do I fit in the world and what do I have to offer other people and what, you know, why, why am I the way I am? Um, so I think that self-actualization versus kind of societal good or, you know, whatever, um, has become kind of the main priority. And so we've seen this shift to very, uh, you know, it's about me, it's about my personality, it's about you know how I find myself in the world. And of course, you gotta then speak into that as a Christian. You gotta talk about identity and how you find it in Jesus and not in beauty and power and your job and you know all these kind of things. And so uh, anyway, so I, I think there's been some, some shifts in that, in that vein. Um, I think you see shifts in regards to immigration that mm -hmm. I think the, the church has to figure out. Um, you know, the, uh, the, the Western world, certainly Canada, you know, I was reading a book the other day and they were talking about how, um, the average immigrant that comes to Canada, cause, cause, cause we have a big immigrant policy yeah, yeah. and it drives the economy. Um, the, the average immigrant that comes to Canada is better educated than a native Canadian. Right. And so yeah. it's like, how does the church in Canada, 37 million people all lined up on the border of America? It's like it's trying to knock on the door and get in uh, or the other way. I don't know. You know, I, you see that picture, right? <laughs> that takeover. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and, and it's like, how does the church in Canada, 37 million people actually reach those people? Well, uh, that means some shifts and changes in the way we do ministry and all of that. So I think we have to kind of try to crack that. You know? And you see that in America, too, that yeah. with the declining birth rate, particularly among sure. those born in America, born in Canada, yeah. really this is happening around the Western world. It's like a lot of people who were born in the West are just deciding we're not going to have kids. We're going to have one kid. We're going to have two kids. Exactly. And so the only way a population grows long term yeah. is via immigration. Now, a lot of that comes with different religious affiliations. Mm -hmm. And then you get into and, you know, Vancouver is very multi-ethnic, multiracial. Mm -hmm. But you get into the second generation and they're often just as secular as people who are born in Canada. Do you find that as well? Yeah. 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 And I think that, you know, reaching that second, third generation is something that uh, is going to be important. And mm -hmm. we got to figure out how to do that. So um, and I think there's a flurry of other things. I think that, you know, the sexual practices have changed. The philosophical questions have changed. The, the family dynamic. There's so many changes that have happened in Canada um, that, that we've seen happen around secularization and different educational things that, you know, th there's a whole flurry of things to crack. So why we did the course was like, okay, as a leader, I'm sure you felt this. I, I'm like struggling and your listeners and viewers probably are like, how do I be an effective leader to reach a culture that I don't necessarily understand? Yeah. The new culture that we find ourselves in that prioritizes these things and not these things, that thinks this way, not this way, that acts this way, not this way. How do we reach them? And what does church look like in this new world? And so that was, you know, a big part of the course that we were doing. One of the things we saw, I think, particularly in 2020 in America, was this idea that the government could stronghold Christianity. 
Mm. Now, I think that ship has sailed. Mm, in sure. It's sailed in Europe. It's sailed in Australia, New Zealand, yeah. the UK. Um, it sh it, that ship sailed in Canada, et cetera. What are the pros and cons of thinking that a government can? Because I think that's where a lot of Americans are like, oh, my goodness, now right. what? Like, we right. kind of lost, you know, maybe we'll lose the Supreme Court. Maybe we lose the White sure. House. Maybe we lose Congress. Maybe we lose the yeah. state gubernatorial uh, right. seat. And we've kind of lived in that reality for a while. So right. what's your take on that? Yeah, I think, I think there's an opportunity uh, because Christianity can show itself to be authentic. I think there's, you know, some negative pieces for sure, culturally, but there's, a, to speak to the positive ones, I think there's an opportunity where the church, no one hated exoskeleton cultural religious uh, mindsets more than Jesus. Read Matthew 23, right? You you build the outside of the- What is exoskeleton? Like, Sorry, like I gotta the ask. Outside of something. Oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so you, let's, so it's kind of like this, hey, don't worry, we have, you know, these, these cultural things that are Christian. Mm. But Jesus goes, yeah, you've cleaned the outside of the cup, but the inside right. of the cup doesn't, you don't actually know God. You've built a world where people say prayers before they go to school, but they still die and go to hell because they didn't know Jesus. Mm. What's more terrifying than a culture that builds itself out in Christendom, but doesn't actually know Christianity, you know? And so it's the sense of like, there's been these walls broken down, which which has had this opportunity for the church to show itself as mm. the counter people. And so where is the Christianity growing? Come back to what we were just saying. Where's Christianity growing? China, Latin America, you know, countries in, in Africa where sometimes Christianity is not even legal or it's being oppressed or it's been nationalized and the leaders have been put in prison. This is where it grows. You know, you've seen this, like, mm -hmm. what do they used to say? The, 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 um, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. The church is like a, na the harder you hit it, the deeper it goes, you know? It's like, that's how we actually grow. And so if you go back through history, I, I, was, I was reading something recently. They talked about the idea that like, Christianity is one of the only religions in the world that has moved around. And so what it means geographically. Okay, so, so think yeah, about yeah, it. yeah. So it starts in the Middle East, among a group and of Jews. And this is long before technology, right? right? Yeah, this is like exactly. thousands of years ago. 2,000 years yeah. ago, it starts with a group of Jews in the Middle wow. East. And then it moves to Rome, mm -hmm. and it becomes kind of the center of the Roman Empire, right? You got, right. by 300 AD, there's 350 million Christians or something. Like, it's crazy how it exploded. And then you've got, it, it stays in the Roman Empire, then it takes over Europe, and it becomes this kind of European thing. Then it gets on a boat and moves to North America. And it becomes the center of Christianity becomes North America, specifically America itself, right? Mm. Now what's happened is it's moved to Latin America. It's moved to uh, Asia and Africa. The face of Christianity today is not white evangelicalism, right? It's not. It's, it's, it's uh, Latin American, it's Asian, and it's African. That's the face of Christianity. It's moved around. Almost every other religion has stayed in its place of origin. So mm. if you look at Hinduism, if you look at Islam, if you look at Buddhism, they're mostly still populated around the countries and geography where they started thousands of years ago, right? Christianity wow. has moved around because here's what it does. It adapts to the cultures so well because it's not fitted to a particular cultural expression. It transcends culture. And so that's the beauty of it. So that's the hope of it is that don't worry just because politically we might be creating rules that m make it harder to be a Christian. It doesn't mean Christianity is going anywhere. Right. Right. And that's the hope that, we, I mean, we, we had, you know, just people in the States go, look, we're creating rules about, you know, same sex marriage and these different things that have happened. And that happened in the U S you know, a, a bunch of years ago, we were, as a country, as you know, we were way ahead of that. Yeah, yeah. And no one even like, it's funny, like when I talk to my American friends and they're like, well, then we had like a, you know, this state decided this. We just woke up one day and it was the law. There was no like question. It was like, hey, Canada, what do you think about this? It was just like one day we woke up and that was, was what it was. And so, because we tend to give our, you know, our, our political structures a little bit more power over the over the, uh, the the communal reality versus we're an individual and we're going to fight right. for our rights. We have that bit of that Canadian spirit. So, anyway, so I think that's some of the dynamic, but it's a beautiful hope because it doesn't mean Christianity is dead. It means it has an opportunity to thrive authentically and actually, to your point, reach the generation like my kids that look at Christianity and go, what is that? Like, you guys hmm. are crazy. And it's like, well, it doesn't have to take that expression. It could take, like I've even said this, Village Church may not, 
be around for the next hundred and like people, we, I'm part of a church and it's 200 years old. It's like, you know, that's like, those people are dead, right? Oh, you're talking, <laughs> you're talking about the building. The building is 200 years old. Maybe Village Church isn't even around 40 years from now because my kids have taken it and done a different version, a different expression of church. That's okay. That's the beautiful thing about Christianity. That's actually quite likely. Yeah. If, if you really think about it, yeah. right? Or that what whether it has a name village, it will not be the expression that you right. have right now, and that's okay. Totally. Okay, while we're on the subject of culture, one of the things that's really come up over the last year is this whole idea that the Western church is being persecuted. And let's talk about mm. the North American church, right? During sure. COVID, yeah. it was like churches weren't allowed to meet, so therefore we were being persecuted yeah. and, and discriminated against, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'd love your take on that because I remember... Uh, you know, when the Supreme Court in Canada ruled on same-sex marriage. And I was getting lots of people emailing me going, sure. Carrie, you got to take a stand. You got to, I'm like, I know where this thing's going. And this was like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I know where this thing's going. I never took a stand. I never, you know, and sure enough, the court did exactly what you would expect the court to do sure. in a post-Christian culture. Right. And, you know, I'm like, this is not, this is not the battle, guys. This is right. actually not the battle. the battle. And now we got these new battles popping up with, sure. well, the church is being discriminated against or the government might, might like right. take away our tax exemption. There's sure. talk about that. Yeah. What is your take on that? Yeah. Like, is that something Christians should be worried about? What, I mean, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's a complicated question because it kind of, kind of depends on a variety of things. But I think, yeah. I think there are things the church gets jacked up about that, like, like we've seen this where it's like, okay, um, you know, during the pandemic, yeah, we couldn't gather. So like my church hadn't gathered since March of that year, 2020. Yeah, 2020. We did, hadn't gathered. Us too. Right? You actually shut right. our church down. That's a joke. You were the last guy to preach there. Right. And then March we couldn't meet again. March right. of 2020, you preach one weekend. Right. And then. <laughs> and we've never gathered since. Now, if it was just Christian churches that yeah. couldn't gather, or even just religious institutions that couldn't gather, uh, then it would feel like persecution. Right. So if restaurants were open, right. shopping malls were open, the Everybody's whole world going, is open. Everybody except Christian institutions, then it'd be like, okay, we're being persecuted. Let's fight the man. Mm. You know, let's mm. let's let's take up. You know, let's go against Caesar and whatever. Right now, it feels like, um, you know, because I don't come at it with a hermeneutic of suspicion that says, I think there's some group sitting, twisting their mustache, trying to figure out how to kill us all or whatever. <laughs> if that's your hermeneutic, then certainly this is- Oh, you're gonna one, find it everywhere, right? Then. This is yeah. one ploy to enslave us all. Mm -hmm. Then of course this is about religious persecution, if that's your starting point. But if you start with, and uh, you know, because the, the question we're talking about is the tension of Christianity and culture, which is a very yeah. complicated question. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an important one because, um, if, if I believe that the government's job is to make decisions for the corporate good, then I, then I begin to understand they're not just making decisions, Carrie, about Conexus Church and Village Church and the theater that we meet in and whether we do hand sanitizing and not. That's not what's in their brain. They have every gathering of every social and religious stripe in the country to think about. Yeah. And they're going, we have to make 30,000 foot decisions that of course there's gonna be 10 hundred footnotes and variations that could be like, but in this scenario, like, you know what it's like, even as a church leader, you make a decision about something and you get emails with 30 different, but what about my scenario? And what mm -hmm. about me? And what about me? And what about me? It's like, yeah, I know. I'm trying to make a decision that benefits the, the, the thousands of people that call this home, not your particular version of your situation, you know? So as leaders, you got to make these macro decisions sometimes for the common good. And I think that's what these leaders are wrestling through is like, how do we make these decisions that are going to have a good long term? Now, nobody's more frustrated than me. Um, and you, we, you've been talking about this. You're a pastor, mm. you know, you love people. I love people. I like to sit in the foyer. I like to love people. I like to hang out. I love to go visit people. I want to do weddings and funerals. I want to do all this stuff again. And I hate that old people are stuck. I hate that the mental health, I hate that youth are sitting like, this is frustrating. This something's got to go on. Right. I think sometimes we give, you know, these people too much power to go, Oh, you're just making decisions in a vacuum about mm what how diseases spread but you got to know there's other factors to consider when you're making decisions right so so i'm frustrated too uh, but i do think the church in this moment does have to be patient 
um, and does need to go, okay, uh, I, I, the, the posture probably can't be, you know, let's, let's defy all of this and, and all the rest of it. Because I think the world looks in and this is a moment where, where the church can be seen as, okay, they're making decisions. This is what it meant to love their neighbor. So, so that's my, I don't know, what's your, as you've been looking at the data, what's your take on it? Yeah, no, I, I do not disagree with you. I don't think we're being persecuted right now. I think if it was one of those things where it was the Christian churches were being singled out or religion as a whole. Sure. You know, one of the things I remember, there was one little skirmish, I don't need to get into the details, between the federal government and Canada a couple of years ago. And Christians were upset about it. And I think with better reason than just, oh, COVID, you know, sure. shut us down. But anyway, you know who was more upset about it? Mm. It was uh, Muslims, Jews, uh, other people who have very, very interesting views on these things. And so Christians actually united with other religions and said, hey, Ottawa, if you're doing this, it actually is discrimination against religion. And so they backed up. It was federal funding based on your particular uh, doctrinal statement is what the issue was. And I thought, you know, that is way more the more likely scenario in the future. And at the end of the day, you've already hinted at it, like the church does really well under persecution. And I think what we are coming to terms with in this generation, Mark, is a lot of leaders just can't get over that the world that they were born into is no longer the world that they live in or do ministry in, that other people have changed their opinions. And it feels Mm -hmm. like a loss of power. Mm -hmm. It feels like a loss of of influence. And so Mm -hmm. what do you do when you feel like you're losing power? If you're unhealthy, you try to grab it back. And that's actually, you know, Andy Stanley preached a sermon years ago, which I, I think is so formative for me. He said, if you look at how power works in almost every culture, every age, you can go back thousands of years to ancient Rome, to, you know, the Grecian empire, Persian empire, whatever. You just pick your, pick your era, pick your culture, Mm -hmm. pick your time. He says, the benefits of power always flow up. So it's like, if you're, if you're the CEO, if you're the leader, if you're the king, you know, you get whatever you want and people do your bidding, you get the money, Mm -hmm. you get the girls, you get the guys, you get whatever you want and you get all the perks of power. And he said, Jesus comes and stands out on his head Mm -hmm. and says, I am not here so that you can serve me. I'm in a position of power so that I can serve and bless you. And so I think it is that, that when we see power taken away, Mm -hmm. we kind of panic And I think a much better approach is to say, okay, what does this make possible? Uh, How can I serve? What can I learn? And I would, I would say, you know, the other thing, there's, there's so many directions I want to go into, but let's, let's talk about, I want to come back to the power vacuum, but let's, let's talk about, um, sort of what you said with, with Keller and identity. You and I had, because we've been together for the better part of a week, a really fascinating dinner conversation, something I've been thinking about. And, you know, when culture, when Christianity disappears from the center of culture, when we're really trying to reach people in culture and Christianity is just not the cultural factor it was a decade or two ago, other idols come in to replace Mm -hmm. God. So a really good example, Tim Keller has preached on this, and I think he quotes a Jewish theologian, I've got it somewhere in my notes, Mm -hmm. but uh, basically, you know, you look at all the pressure on marriages these days and how that's collapsing. Well, a hundred years ago, it's like I look to God to fulfill some of my emotional needs. And then my partner helps me with some of those emotional needs too. But your spouse is not actually designed mm-hmm. to bear the weight of all of your emotions. Yeah. And what happens if you look at Instagram weddings and Pinterest weddings and it has to be perfect and you're the person who completes me and fulfills me, like human beings collapse under that weight. And yeah. when you, I was talking yeah. to Adam Grant on this podcast and he said, you know, now that the church is in decline, work has actually overtaken uh, a sure. lot of people as the central part of their life yeah. and they're collapsing under it. Yeah. And it leads to that bigger discussion, you know, that whole identity. Well, now I'm going to define myself by my gender. I'm going to define myself by my sexuality. Mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. define myself by my money. I'm going to define myself yep. by my work. Yeah. Um, that whole identity thing is yes. a real issue. Yeah. Talk about what happens when God disappears from culture. Yeah, well, it, it, exactly that. I think, I think Alison McGrath, the way he put it is, um, we will always transcendentalize something when we take the transcendent away. So you're, you take God away from a culture. Um, I mean, you look at even um, uh, Ernest Becker, who was this uh, uh, psychologist in the 70s, wrote a book and he talked about, like when psychology wants to take the concept of sin away from us because they don't like the theology of it, it doesn't solve anything because human beings know there's something wrong with them. They know they're broken. They know there's a plight. And all that does is put the pressure back on them because they can't look to something else to save them. Yeah. 
-hmm. So they end up looking to themselves and then they're crushed under the weight of the fact that they know they can't be their own savior. Uh, so it's this very idea. You take the God, you take the concept of God away and we replace it not with uh, true atheism functionally. Right. We replace it with paganism. That's what Newbigin said. Uh, we, it's not that the, the, the secular world means there's no God. It means that we've just replaced the gods with sex, money, power, beauty, family, comfort, work, you know, whatever. Uh, and the bottom line is what you just said, that all those things crush you um, because they can be taken away. I mean, imagine you worshiped beauty and you got a you got a scar across your face. Yeah, you have a car accident you car and accident. you're never the yeah. same. Imagine you worship work and it gets taken from you and and you're not successful anymore. Nobody cares anymore. You know, all of these things, these are the these are like what would I find my identity in if I well, you know, there was a there was a uh, a time, I remember this, hmm. probably five or six years ago, I lost my voice. Yeah. Uh as a and as a preacher. I got up and I, I could, I had to go to voice like therapy and they were discussing like, dude, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, I yell at people every <laughs> week for four hours, you know, because I'm doing four services at the time, running around our town to the different That's sites. Why and you lost your voice. And I lost my voice. And there was a moment where I kind of looked at the church and I went, you know, um, I'm pretty well useless to you if I lose my voice. Like if my voice box gets ripped, you know, when I, I, I grew up, my neighbors ripped the voice box out of their dog. And it was kind of, I, I was actually glad wow. I mean, because, because okay. you know, it was the dog barked all day, every day. But I was sad in the sense of, it was sad. It was like, <laughs> you know, all day. I know. And I'm like, okay, so imagine I didn't have a voice. I'm useless to you, Village Church. Like I can't do anything, you know, whatever. And it's like your identity like, Carrie, you talk for a living. No, I know. I Imagine thought about that. I think anymore. I talk and I write. When I broke my hand right. uh, months right. and months ago now, I'm That's like, am I going to be able to write? It was yeah. so funny because, you know, the, the surgeons, the plastic surgeon, the physicians, they were like, what do you do for a living? When I told them I was a writer, they're like, oh, you'll be fine. Like, you're not actually a real person like a mechanic or something that uses your hand, <laughs> right? Like, uh, I'm like, all I have to be able to do is type. Yeah. And so yeah. you get these moments to, in life. Yeah where these things get, you know, these things get taken away and then you're kind of left to go, you know, who am I? What's my contribution? Meaning or origins, morality, destiny, these questions start coming to the surface and we have to be able to answer those questions. So I think coming back to the bigger conversation, these are the, we can speak into a culture that doesn't have answers to these things and actually provide them. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful thing that we've seen. And it, it's effective and it works to go guys, I'm going to give you answers to the vision of your life questions that you have nothing to die for. You have nothing to live for. You don't know, you know, years ago in Vancouver, the Canucks lost a, a, a hockey game and all the, the, they burned down the city. They did this yeah, massive that. riot and they burned down the city. And you know what I did the next Sunday? I got up and I looked out and I said, you know who burned down our city? Young men with no vision. And the culture's not giving you one. Your college never gave you one. Your parents never gave you one, but I can give you one. I got a guy you can follow that you can give everything up for. You can die for him. You can put all your energy and time into it. This is a vision for your life. You have no mission. You have no understanding about what your place is in the world. And so what do they do? They, they take all that energy and all that time and they corrupt and destroy themselves and the culture around them rather than bringing um, shalom. Right. P, like when you mm -hmm. talked about people who join hands with the different religions, you know what that is. If you read Bonhoeffer and Niebuhr and C.S. Lewis, and these, what they're doing is they kind of raise this question of like, there might be moments when the church has to join hands with people of different ideological streams in order to accomplish something that they all agree on together. They might not have the same doctrinal statement, but they're trying to bring shalom. They're trying to bring peace to the earth mm -hmm. in this thing that you're talking like these different social settings. This is kind of the, the tension of being in the church right now, right? So I think it's fascinating that we figure out how to do that well. So we're in this place where that, I think, is a fairly good description of post-Christianity. You get into sure. uh, a lot more detail inside the Art of Better Reaching, but it can leave a lot of people feeling hopeless. If they're yeah. like, oh my goodness, if this is where it's going and it's just gonna get worse, which yeah. arguably it will be, sure. people are like, what do we do? Just pack it in? Like, do we go right. home? And yet you've managed to create a church and we've done it to some extent as well, where we're reaching thousands of people every weekend who are hungry for the message of the gospel. Yeah. How does that happen? Like, because you're not, you know, you, you can get into the place where you're like, well, I gotta change the message. I just have to sure. like basically change my theology. Right. 
to update it. Yeah. Uh, I would argue that the culture is looking for an alternative to itself, not yeah. an echo yeah. of itself. Yeah. And I, I would have a hard thing. time yeah. changing it. But yeah. like you're, you're doing that, you're challenging young men who burn down the city going, you guys have no vision. And they're you all lining no, up. No, yeah, you guys, you guys have no vision. You got no vision. You're sitting around there being lazy, losing that's your whole Gary's life. Impersonation right? of that's me. my Mark impersonation. Yeah. But you, you know, you're doing that, and yet they're office. lining up. They're lining yeah. up to hear that message. It's very yeah. counterintuitive. Yeah. How do you speak into a culture then that is well, that post-Christian yeah. and appears to be that far from God? Yeah. Well, I think, I, and we talk about this in the course about um, you got to be able to do it authentically. Mm. People, they're, 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 they're so what does that been, mean well, authentically? They, well, they've been through Christianity and out the other side. And it's not like you're coming into a jungle and speaking it to them for the first time ever. And they go, oh my goodness, this is such a beautiful idea. A man, you know, came and died for me in my place and rose again. And this is crazy. I should give my life to this. Like that's the pure beauty of the gospel. Um, what they're hearing is they're coming out the other side of it going, oh, I've already been, and they're going Christianity. The, the hypocrisy, the institution, the power grabs, the gender problem, all this stuff. I don't want all that. They don't want all the trappings. Mm. And so what you got to try to do is clear all that away and go, Jesus, the issue is Jesus. You reject this based on Jesus. Don't reject it based on the right. bad fumblings of the people who tried to follow Jesus. Um, and so authentically means uh, that we as leaders try to embody, here's my life based on the grace of God, I'm, I'm not perfect. I'm not the hero of this story. I'm not the hero of this church. Jesus is, you know? So I constantly look at my people and it's like, don't look at me. I'm not gonna slide down the fire pole and come rescue you from all your problems. You know, don't, I, gotta, I got three girls I gotta try to raise. Do your, be the church to each other. Like, don't look at me all the time. Like, I'm busy, you know? It's <laughs> like, let the church be the church. I don't wanna be the hero of your story because I'm gonna fumble it. And most of my stories, are stories about times where I fumble, yeah. times where I make mistakes. So that's authenticity, that's being authenticity. honest. I think that's the currency we have in this moment is the honest, because then, then they see this guy's dependent on the grace of the gospel too. He's not a perfect person trying to lead us from a place of perfection. Right. He's, he's, a, he's a co-laborer in grace and trying to, you know, I, I have often, and I don't know why, and at some point I assume I'll probably write this book, but in the midst of talking about what's the next kind of thing I want to tackle, one of the things that comes up, and, and we we're kind of joking about it, is like the title of a book for me is like, I love Jesus, but I swear a little. Mm. And it's like reflections of a pastor who's, tr you know, trying his best, but basically bringing together the whole theology of grace and stories. Like we've talked about the people who are on your podcast who get some of the most downloads are people who have fumbled mm -hmm. and people who are like, they have, they have limps. And it's like, that's what the world connects with. Yeah. It's leaders that have made mistakes and they're broken and they're trying to figure it out because people, they, they don't want the perfect hero. They want the hero that's gone through the cross and come mm -hmm. out and raised from the dead on the other side. They don't want just the guy who's never had problems or the girl who's never had problems. We gotta, the point is, we gotta let people into that. And I think that's the power of it. So anyway, so. Um, so there's an authenticity. Yep. And you would say that theologically, we don't need to get into detail, details, but you would be rather orthodox theologically. Yeah, and I, and I think as, as you have studied, you have studied this and, and I've looked at this where uh, in Canada and in the United States and across the world, the, the denominations that go away from orthodox Christianity being centered theologically on the Bible and the gospel, mm. and they die. Yeah. The bottom line is they die. Jesus rose from the dead in your heart, but not in reality. No one gets up early and dies for that. No <laughs> one gives th their money to that. You know, no one gets their head chopped off for that in the first century. Right, right. No one gets pulled across apart by lions for, hey, Jesus walked on water metaphorically. He would have totally sunk, but don't worry about it because miracles have some heavenly meaning for your earthly life. Like, what? Give me a break. So people who are uh, sold out 
to an idea and passionate about that idea. That's what compels people. That's what draws people into something like a magnet. And I mean, you've seen that. Yeah. Passion, you know, uh, full identity with your cause. I look at like the Martin Luther King Juniors of the world, mm -hmm. leaders of movements. You know what you have to have? absolute identity with that cause. It's your whole being. It's not some side job you do for 40 hours a week right. while you're doing other stuff. It's not something, not something you inherited or no. that. It's like, you know what? I didn't know what to do with my life, so I thought I'd try ministry. All right, I went to yeah. Bible college. I got my thing, and now I'm testing this out, poking around. Hey, I like mm -hmm. you guys because my dad didn't like me, so I'm replacing my daddy issues with trying to have a church that <laughs> likes me and my sermons and greet me at the door and tell me I did a good job. It's like, you know, I get it, no one's storming the gates of hell for that. Right. It's like, they're gonna storm the gates of hell with leaders that go, I would take a bullet for this. Hmm. You know, I would literally die for this. What do you do when people push back against the authentic message of Christianity? Cause you get that all the time. Yeah. It's like, really, that's what you believe about sexuality or that's what you right. believe about money or that's what you believe about the histor historicity of scripture or the authenticity sure. of Jesus or why wasn't the resurrection metaphorical? Like you right. get those questions every sure. day. Yeah. You've written books. If you mm -hmm. haven't picked up Mark's books, Problem of God, Problem of Jesus, they're great books on that. But like, just practically speaking, when people, when you get an email yeah. or a DM on social and it's yeah. like, clearly, you know, you don't believe that right. in 2021, right. what, what do you say? Part of it is getting people to, you got to push back a bit and get them to ask the question why they disbelieve it. Mm. Because the job of a theist is not always to defend their theistic views against atheism as if atheism or agnosticism or generic spirituality is right by default and the theist has to prove themselves. I always try to flip it and go the other way and go, why? what do you mean? Why wouldn't I believe in this? Of course. Why do you believe in that? Yeah. You know, why, why, stop breaking eggs. Why, do you have okay. any eggs? Do you have, <laughs> do you have a faith position at all? Because here's what I know. Every time you say to me, this is silly, and one of your family members dies after suffering for two years in the hospital, you think that they're not suffering anymore. But how do you know that? Because you have a faith position, a metaphysical belief about what happens to a soul in the afterlife, which is it disappears and there isn't a soul. But that's a faith position because you don't know. So why do you have a faith position that you assume by default is true when you just made it up by sitting around having dinner and you're just taking ideas and what feels good? I have one based on a book that's got this many authors, this much history. I got, I actually, I have ideas that have been tested. You have ideas you came up around the dinner table. So let's talk about that. And how do people respond to that when you tell them that? Okay, good point. You know, whatever. <laughs> on, a, on a DM, no, of course, they don't goes, tend to no, just no, no, come to Jesus overnight. They don't come to Jesus over no, DM. But, but no, that, that's really interesting. They go, Screw you, bro. You don't even know what you're talking about, and I hate you and your voice. You know, that's usually the response. But but as I build relationships with people or people mm. at the church, they begin to question why they believe what they believe. Yeah. And then some of them, if they're sincere in their journey, will replace bad ideas with good ideas. And that's what I think our posture partly needs to be. We're living in a world of ideas. We've talked about this a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're living in an idea where people are exchanging ideas everywhere, whether that's mm -hmm. long form podcasting or on YouTube or whatever, it's all ideas, right? Like what's the kid, my kids were talking about some kid on YouTube that makes 12 million bucks a year to review toys. And it's like, man, I wasn't, I got a long job, job man. Mm -hmm. Like this, this kid is cracked. These are ideas that go viral, social epidemics that tip um, and they're all idea based in a sense. And Christianity should be in, right in the midst of that conversation. Yeah. Because for 2000 years, it's been what I would say the best idea in the marketplace of ideas bar none. It's what built hospitals, it's what built universities, yeah. it's what built philosophy, it's what built science. So why are we abandoning it as if it's dumb? And here's what people don't understand. People don't understand that, you know, cause you, you, you read what's happening in the press, you read what's happening among your friends and they're like, I don't believe it anymore. All the deconversion stories, et cetera, sure, et cetera. Sure. But most people are three questions away from yes. their worldview collapsing. Right. Yeah. That's true of Christians, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, why do you believe in the resurrection? Well, cause you know, the Bible says so. Why do you believe in the Bible? It's like, well, cause the Bible says so. Well, why do you, and then it's like, I don't know. 
I don't know. But that's true of atheists, that's true of agnostics, that's true of people who are spiritual but not Christian. It's like that thing, like, okay, well, why do you believe your friend isn't suffering anymore? Why do you believe nothing happens after you die? And most people can't get to the third answer. They can't get that. And so I think it's, it's, it's asking enough questions to make people go, huh, maybe I'm not as sure about this stuff as I was. Right. And I think the, I think it was D.A. Carson, I'll probably hack this, but I'm just thinking about it now. He said something like, you know, the first generation one, you know, because it's the question of do you want to actually continue teaching the Bible and theology? Will that work anymore? You know, we we're talking about right, that. Right, or right. do you abandon theology and just kind of ride your unicycle around and try to attract people to your church? <laughs> and it's like, no, you got to teach the Bible because it's the power of God and the salvation. It actually works. Um, but Carson said, if you don't do that, if you pivot away from that, he says, Generation, the first generation is going to assume that people just know Christianity. And so they'll go on it. The second generation will question it. And the third generation will just walk away from it. Mm. Um, and it's this idea that like, no, you actually do. Every generation have to come back to biblical, theological thinking, philosophical right. worldview building thinking, and not just assume it and move on to praxis and behavior. And so um, that's one of the things that we did in the course. So let me just flip the script a little bit for you. You, in this course, taught some amazing stuff practically about how to get leaders and churches to reach people in the post-Christian world that we find mm-hmm. ourselves in. What are kind of two or the three big things that you were like? A couple of big. These are the big things we have to nail. Ideas I got to really double click on that I was excited. We are still obsessed with attendance. And uh-huh. attendance in the online world has become views, right? So right. it's all about like, wow, did a thousand people watch your video? Did 10,000 people watch yeah. your video? A hundred thousand, how can this go viral? And so we kind of break down some of the stereotypes in that. And what I found uh, about content as a content creator is that content in and of itself, um, it, it's a great way to get your message out there, but most people are missing it. So right. I got a unit in the Art of Better Reaching on what I call the digital engagement funnel. Mm. And like Village Church, like you have a national following. You're building a national church across Canada and different provinces. And there are American churches who do exactly the same thing. They're like totally... Like they've got a national following and even small churches now, thanks to the pandemic, you might have 200 people, but you got like 50 people watching you from New York state or, or from Alabama or wherever you happen to be or the UK. It's a brand new world. But what a lot of people don't do is they think, oh, because you're watching my sermon, you're part of my church. That's Mm -hmm. not actually true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the keys to really engaging people, and you've done this, you've got, you were telling me the other night at dinner, how many baptisms? Tisms do you have a year into COVID? Like, so at the one year mark of COVID, you got, yeah. or how many, how many different people have you connected with yeah, who are so new to Village? We did a, um, so we have a baptism coming up uh, this week that's 100 people, which is super exciting. And then I think we baptized 50 or 60 others, you know, six months ago or something. But yeah, for a church that hasn't met in person. Yeah, so baptisms are actually difficult to do right now, and I think okay. people are reluctant. I think I asked you the wrong question. Yeah, that's yeah. still pretty amazing. Yeah, but, but like, but wasn't it a thousand yeah. people that you connected with? Yeah. Renew? So what we started to do since March was basically look and go. Um, I don't want to just see how many clicks or views or whatever. Um, the way yeah. I want to define this is how many people who've never attended a physical location became part of our church, meaning. They started giving, they started going to a community group, they started, they became a member, they took some of our classes, they gave us their information, you know, all of those things. That means that you're wanting to become part of Village. How many people right. have done that? And so in the last year, online, 1,500 people have fit into that category. So way more than that, just kind of watch our sermons every week. Right, but right. 1,500 people. Uh, Said, hey, my name's Carrie. My name's Carrie. I want to start giving. I want to get in a community group. And I live in Wisconsin. I live in Ottawa. I live in whatever. And I want to become part of this. Yeah. And so that's where, like you're talking about, moving them to deeper levels of commitment where they're actually becoming part of the church, where they're saying, I want to actually be part of this thing. And that's exactly it, because the challenge is 10,000 views and zero baptisms. Yeah, you know, right. a thousand views and nobody's following Jesus. Right. And some of those that that even gets beyond. And this is the now that we're sort of into a more mature phase of digital content, like everyone's been online for a year and a half, the whole deal. And some some viewers have been on that yeah. a lot earlier than that. But it's like, great, you can look at those metrics. And it's it's like that criticism of the old mega church. It's like 10,000 people. But how many people are really following Jesus? Sure. Yeah. And so I think what you have to do is do exactly what you did through that digital engagement funnel. It's like, great, we got a thousand views, a hundred views, 10,000 views, doesn't really matter. 
let us know who you are. Yeah. And churches haven't cracked that code yet. Right. So if you go on most websites, the second step of the digital engagement funnel is actually uh, where you send your name to mm -hmm. somebody. It's like, here's my email address, yep. you know? Right. Carrie at CarrieNewhoff.com, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. There's my email address. And then you all of a sudden connect with me personally. Yep. And I go into your database and somebody follows up. You send me an email, you shoot me a text, you send me a video. You're like, yep. hey, how can we help you? Right. And then you need to get a clear next step. Yep. Um, hopefully at that point, somebody becomes a Christian. And then on the other side of the funnel, and this is the really cool part mm -hmm. of the digital engagement funnel, is uh, the people you reach start sharing on their own channels a message that you sure. preached yeah. or uh, something that happened to them or a website or a course that they took. Right. And uh, that is really what digital engagement means. Sure. It's the same thing. It's basically the digital equivalent of what happens when someone shows up to your church in person yeah. because you know it's fun to have a full room, but at the end of the day, if people are just coming and going yeah. and they never connect. They never take a membership class. They never do alpha. They never do starting point. They never get baptized. They never join a small group. Yeah. Never serve, never give, never invite a friend. What good is it? It's, it's, it's I call them non-contributing zeros at my church from the stage. <laughs> Why are you here? What are you, if you're a Christian, if you're, if you're seeking, I don't yeah, care yeah. if you, you sit take here a year and to go and suck all the resources you want. I don't care. But if you're a Christian and you're sitting here, you're not giving, you're not a community group, you're not serving. What are you doing here? Honestly, like this is, this is a crew, this is not a cruise ship. This is a battleship. We got 15 minutes on this planet. What are you doing with your life? Like, don't be cheap. Mm. You know what do you, cause when you don't give, you're making the single mom with two kids. She's making, and I know people, like, it's crazy. You see people and they're like, they will just take resources, take, 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 and they will just move on to the next thing. And that's a thing a lot of people don't understand that, yeah, you're going to get rid of a few people that way, but what are you really losing? Not, right. much. Not much. Not much. Yeah. You gain a seat, right? right. But what you get is you get people to step up yeah. in that model. Right. And so yeah. in one of the units, I go through the whole digital engagement model yeah. and show helpful. you how to yeah. get people to connect, how, what you can do, give you really concrete ideas. And to think about using online as the tip of the spear, for those of you who might wrestle with like, well, online church isn't real church. My ecclesiology is such that, you know, you got to be gathered and, you know, fair enough. I understand that. It's like, well, then use it as evangelism. Don't right. think of it as like, this is my church. Think of it as evangelism that starts you here and moves you down into something of deeper levels of commitment. Um, how much money, time, energy, staffing would it take for in the last, like, imagine I was sitting here right now and I said, well, you know, I started a, a campus from scratch, Carrie, yeah. and it went from zero to 1500 people and has a budget of X because those 1500 people gave X amount of dollars. Man, it's been quite a year. You'd be like, write a book. Yeah, that's this amazing. This is insane. You've cracked the growth code. And people think about all the time, energy, money that gets saved. You can do this online. Well, you just did For it. For one-tenth the price, energy, time, energy, mm -hmm. all of it. We have one or two staff working on this. Now, that's one of the things we're, we're learning from you. We got to get more staffing on this because this is a real thing. This Think about you plant in a city that has 100,000 people. You have a population lid that you're going to hit as a church plant. Right, hundred percent. Well, online, and, and, what's your population lid? Eight billion. Yeah, exactly. We have five languages in our services uh, online. You can watch our services in five languages: Korean, um, uh, Mandarin, Spanish, French, and English. Because it comes up in subtitles every single sermon. Costs us fifty thousand dollars a year to put subtitles of all those five. Because we want to, we don't. We're not just talking to little South Surrey. Hey guys, glad you're here. We want to go. Okay, if we want to try to reach Canada, we got to crack languages. That's the first mm. contextual incarnational question you have mm. to ask. You don't talk to your neighbor if they can't talk a language. Right, so you're talking to preaching, but you're not putting it into their world. You're only going to get that limited group of people. Well, and the, the other thing you would say about online too, like think about online dating. Um, a lot of people are like, well, is that a real thing? Is that not a real thing? Right. It's like online ministry. But, sure. but here's what online dating does. I have never met a couple who said, we've been married five years, we met online, but we've never actually met in person. 
They've all met in person. It's like online sure. dating takes yeah. you on a funnel. Good it's analogy, like, yeah. hey, I think you're kind of cute. And it's like, hey, do you want to get together for coffee? And then coffee right. becomes dinner and dinner becomes let's go out. And then you get engaged and right. then you get married and then you move in together, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So what online does is it leads to real relationships. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think church leaders need to figure that out. Like, yeah. yeah, you got like, I don't know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of views on your video over the year. But you made 1,500 real connections. Yeah that can result in real baptisms, real discipleship. And that's why the digital engagement funnel is so important. And that's why saying, hey, I got like 5,000 people to watch my message on Sunday, so what? Like if it yeah. could result in zero baptisms yeah. and you could be the leader with a hundred people who see a message, mm -hmm. but if you've got an engagement funnel working mm -hmm. and 10 of them actually make a connection with you yeah. and two of those get baptized and three of them give their life to Christ and you know, da, 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 down the road, you're making a lot of progress. And yeah. I think that's what people really have to understand that we don't understand, but there is still this disparaging of digital ministry. Yeah. But think about this too, right? Like your new front door, we always talk about, you know, ministry starts with the sermon. No, it doesn't. It's starts in the lobby. No, it doesn't. Starts in the parking lot. No, actually it starts on your website. Yeah. It probably starts even on YouTube or your social media now. Yeah. And so your first impression is a digital impression yeah. and we all behave that way, yeah. right? When was the last time you and Aaron, your wife, went to a restaurant without checking it out online first? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've checked it out on Yelp. You've been to their website. You checked out the menu. And so your online footprint becomes really important. So we cover all that inside yeah, the course. What else are you learning about the art of reaching people in a post-Christian culture, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I think that people... Um, they want, they have needs. And as we talk about in the course, like they're human needs. They're not Christian needs or agnostic needs or atheist needs. Oh, they're, yeah. they're needs, yeah. they're human needs. Um, and being able to show the, the beauty of the gospel as not just a belief system, but as a, as a, as the true fulfillment of all the longings and the, you know, the, the deepest motivating factor of anyone's life is their own pleasure. So how do you frame Christianity as the fulfillment of the ultimate thing that you're looking for when you try to go to all these different things for pleasure and delight and fulfillment in life and they can't provide it? How does Jesus actually provide it? And if we're presenting that in both word and deed as a local body, mm. people will be, you know, people are funny. Like their church is a hundred and and it's not growing and and they wonder why. And sometimes it's just demographics and situations and I get that and don't be too hard on yourself. But sometimes it's because like, yeah, you're you're teaching the truth, but you're not nice. And they and they and they tend to focus on like, yeah, but you know, the truth is offensive. It's like true. No, you're but, offensive. But but you realize, yeah, you realize like when Jesus like lived, people were actually they gravitated toward him. You know, there's a reason he has to feed 5,000 people and not <laughs> three people. Yeah. Um, they're all like, he's compelling, he's inch, he's loving, he actually cares about our stuff. Like, I think love, even though in these conversations, I was thinking about this yesterday, as yeah. we do this course and build it out, we don't, we tend to talk about strategy and tactical realities, and we have to in order to, you know, equip leaders. But you know, Jesus in, in John 13 goes like, you know how the world's going to know you love. Like, mm -hmm. it's not truth or you know, whatever. And all of that's important, but it's like, do we do we love people well? Like, I because that's that's the most like. Okay, think about this from a, from a sociological perspective. Okay, so uh, I just thought of this: Mormonism. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mormonism. When you look at the theology of Mormonism. Uh, and if you're a Mormon watching this, I, I don't, I'm not trying to offend you. I'm just trying to make an illustration. Um, if I sat across from the table with you and just explained the basic myth doctrine of Mormonism, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's pretty interesting stuff. Like there's some interesting stuff in there. But so why do people still become Mormons in the Western world? When you talk to people who are attracted toward Mormonism, you know what they say? These people are the nicest people on the planet. Like you gotta understand, you know those elders that come to your door? They don't just come to your door, I don't know if you know this, and explain theology to you. You know what they do? They say, it looks like you're trying to cut your grass, but you're kind of old. Do you want us to come back on Saturday and cut your grass? You need like leaves, they come and they'll do anything for the community. They actually serve it, they love it. Islam is the same. Islam is a very community-oriented religion. They love their community well. They care about it well. 
Then you got Chris like, wah, wah, we got there, but we're part of the truth. I got the truth. And it's like, we'll, we'll be known gosh. by our opinions, not by our love. Yeah. And it's like, guys, man, like in the new talking about how to reach the post Christian world, we got to be better than just having the truth. Because how do you, how does anyone gonna listen to the truth if you never listen you never enter into conversation with them you never listen to them you never like if if we had no reciprocal relationship we were talking about this the other day. here's a really practical thing that mm. we were chatting about with uh, your wife Tony the other night too is when you get to a certain level of leadership I thought this is really profound yeah. right do you want to maybe you, you no, continue no, you tell, you well tell, when you, you get tell. to a certain level of leadership you start to realize something happens and it's that people stop asking you questions yeah. and you get into relationships where there's no reciprocity. Right. It's, it's a lot of leaders are dealing with that right now. Yeah. It's basically you get in a friendship with someone and you're the one that's over dinner. You're the one asking questions all the time. How do you do it? But they never look at you and go, you know, Carrie, how is it running this Carrie Newhoff brand organization. I mean, you've blown up online. You have this podcast that's very, every leader wants to, you know, have mm. you inform. You've done this such a great job leading and founding this church for 30 years, all this amazing thing. Carrie, I'm just wondering what you're doing or how are you, what are you struggling with or whatever? Mm. It's rarely that directed. And, it, you know, it's like, how hard is it for then for you to to really care about them if they're never really listening to you? You're constantly listening to them. And our posture toward the world needs to be like, man, I'm, I'm investing in you. I'm listening to you. I'm loving on you. Um, and then they're going to give you a hearing to care, to think about what you Great believe. Analogy. Why would, again, why would anyone just believe, if you just read the doctrines of Mormonism on a page, I'm not sure you'd be like, hand up, I'm in. It's that person and how they loved you that makes you even think about it twice. That is a very real temptation when the world is becoming more and more postmodern in real time to think about what you want from the world, not right. for your world. Yeah, that's good. I want you to sit up. I want you to believe. I want you to show up. I want yeah. you to watch. I want you to engage. And that becomes that very unbalanced relationship sure. where Jesus actually loves the world, which we often forget in the church, and he died for the world. And he wants to help the world. Yeah. And I think that's a great analogy. Okay, last thing. You talked about, because the big criticism of large churches like yours or a church like Connexus or the church of a, a lot of people who are watching is it's all show. You just got thousands of people showing up, but there's no real substance or depth. Totally. And that can be a critique of evangelism or the art of reaching people in a post-Christian culture. Yeah. But you got this like wheel uh, and you did a session. We kind of didn't have it in the original course, but right. I want you to share that because I, I want to get as much of this content out there one way or the other, and yeah. people can decide by True. themselves whether they want to go any deeper. <laughs> but like, do you know all eight of those components? Or can you give, uh, give us give yeah. us a sampling concept, of what it is? Well, first off, you've got to be able to be a performer, guys. Uh, you got to come to my church. You got to be able to perform because that's why people come I don't to know church. what that that's was. That's the answer. Mm-hmm. Good night. Um, but that's okay. Thank you. No, that's what that's, they think it is. They think it's a dog is, and pony right? show, right? Yeah. It's yeah. a it's a so, Mark Clark show, but it's not the Mark Clark. Yeah, show. Don't do that. The mm. people, the people, the <laughs> people. That, that was fun. I hope you're like, watching because like, that made no sense on, on audio, but that okay. was that was actually kind of fun. <laughs> okay, so cracked up the crew. So, so basically, okay, here's the deal. Um, if all you do is your professional guy on stage and your whole church has to bring people to you to, you know, be reached or whatever. That's not what's going to be effective it, to reach the post-Christian West in the no. next generation. The it's dog and pony show isn't going to work. No. More haze, more music, yeah. you know, more louder work. preaching. Right. Not exactly. going to work. Not gonna, so it's got to be the people take the missionary task unto themselves. Mm. Right. Ephesians four. It's like, Hey guys, what's your job to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That has to be what leaders are doing. It's like, it's better to have a hundred missionaries than just one missionary on stage that a hundred people bring their friends to. Yeah. What if yeah. people were coming to Jesus, not at nine and 11 on a Sunday, but at Wednesday afternoon at four in your living room. And mobilizing the people, those people, the people. That's to be evangelists. To so, so, uh, so that's a really important shift that needs to take place. And people have been talking about this for a long time. Like the, sure. the, the, the you can't do just the sh the come and see, you gotta do the go and be. So, uh, but anyway, the point to answer your question is, um, yeah, we don't want people to just show up for a performance. We want to create disciples. That's a great commission. The great commission is not that you have 
your influence as a church. You can have all the influence in the world, and if you're not making disciples, you're not actually a good church, as I heard, I think, John Tyson say recently. So it's like, how do you then make disciples? What is a disciple? So we broke it down, and we said, well, what are the things that make up the disciple we want to create as a church? Right. And so we said, okay, it's got to be someone who, you know, is biblical. You know, the biblical worldview. Doc, we teach doctrine. You have biblical thinking. You have devos in your life. You actually think biblically. That's number one. But usually the church just stops there. And it's like, my job is just to teach people the Bible. Right. And it's like, well, not really. Like if you go back to the first century, half those people couldn't read. So it's like, I'm not sure reading the Bible was the only bar and litmus test of Christianity. It's like, okay, godliness. We want people to be godly and have character. Wow. We want people to have stewardship of their money, time, resources, talents, you know, their bodies. We want people to live missionally. Mm. Meaning it's not just Jesus as example. I enter in incarnationally to the mission of Jesus in the right. world. And so I'm loving on people. So it might be evangelism. And that's usually how people have framed missional life is just, right. well, you do evangelism. It's well, no, no, you do social work. You're for the poor. You love widows and orphans, as James talks about. You're involved in the race stuff that's bringing equality and gender, the, all of these things. Um, you're actually walking with people incarnationally. You're living in your condo and having barbecues and including them in your life. You know, all of this, this is what it means to be a disciple. Um, yeah. Did you so, also have a category, and I could get it, get it wrong because I'm going by memory, yeah. but like, you want people to think theologically. Yeah. Like, so, so there was there was the biblical one and then there was the apologetics one. Where we yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about that for a minute. Good. We want people to actually be able to defend the faith. First Peter right, and I'll be able to defend right. the, the faith when people ask. And so um, and so uh, we want people to be able to answer the big questions of sexuality and evil and suffering. And is the Bible legit? And what about science and faith? Like, can you in an informed way be able to defend the ideas of Christianity in the marketplace of conversation? And so we want wow. people to be able to be able to defend faith and actually think like that, not just go, well, I got my little Bible study. I take my little Instagram photo. I think biblically and that's all I do. It's like, no, you know, people in the world have questions. Can you answer any of those questions? You know, um, wow. and so I think that's five, uh, six it was communal. We want the church not mm. to just be individual, but communal, both locally and globally, understand themselves that just saying a prayer and moving on with your life, raising right. your hand, living, looking at the television, that's not actually the biblical form of Christianity. It's like temple, body, family. These are the images the New Testament gives. You got to bring your own gifts. You got to allow yourself to be called out. You got to come under leaders. You got to have church discipline. All of these things need to be part of what a actual disciple is in the world. If you want a fully rounded person, that's actually like, okay, now I know kind of a target to shoot for. What impressed me about that is it, how robust it was because historically it's been evangelism or discipleship. And I've always said, right. no, it's both. Yeah. It's evangelism. Yeah. You can't have a lot of churches are like, well, we just make disciples. Sure. It's like, have you ever reached anybody in five years? Right. Right. And yeah, your so people don't is, actually that make people. That's not actually yeah. discipleship. Yeah, yeah. And then other people, it's all about evangelism. We win them and then we lose them. Right. right. And, yeah. and, and of course the answer is no, but what I love was how robust that was. Mm -hmm. And when you really look at it, yeah. so those are, those are great to remember six of the eight. Uh, 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 the, what, the other one is love, love, be people yeah. defined by love. And that's John 13. Like what's the point of doing any of this unless we're loving people. Okay. Yeah. So that's number seven. That's yeah. really and impressive. Number but number eight, spiritual disciplines, which means like ah. we want you to not only believe certain things, that the point of life is not just to be like Jesus. You gotta have union with Christ. And then being like Jesus is derivative. It's downstream of a union with Christ. So how are you gonna do that? You gotta have habits in your life. You gotta have prayer and fasting and mm. worship and study. These are all disciplines that actually produce the results of being like Jesus. We sometimes start with, hey, just go be like Jesus. I'm like, how do I get there? What are the habits? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the habits or the things I have to do? So those are the eight things that we looked at and went, this is a fully formed disciple. Now we gotta revolve ministry, preaching, teaching, worship, strategy, money, budgets, campuses around this kind of thing. So that's the kind of, you know, disciple we want to try to create. So, so Wow. Yeah. So good. It's so good. Yeah. Okay. Mark, Thanks once again, it's me, been brother. a joy. And this course so is, it's 10 uh, sessions, awesome to do it. some bonus, yeah. lots of video, uh, yeah, lots team of application yeah. guide. We'll say more about it, yeah. but what's your hope? Uh, for people, if they decide to do the art of better reaching, we try to give away a lot of the content in this interview, but obviously yeah. there's a lot more in all the videos and we can do in yeah. a one hour conversation. Well, but what I loved about it is so practical, but I, I yeah. think, I think, uh, well, you bring the philosophical, I bring yeah. the practical. You were very practical, but you're also practical, very tactical. Yeah. And, and, and you brought the philosophy and theology to it too. I think, I think it will, that balance will help people like actually 
have things that they can do to go, I'm going to do this differently next month in my church. It's going to affect ministry, methodology, how we do, you know, all these things. So I think it'll help people. And that's my hope for it, that it actually helps make us all better at reaching the post-Christian world that we find ourselves in right now, because things have shifted, things have changed. And sometimes we don't know what to do. And sometimes we're distracted. And sometimes we feel like we're not the right leader to be effective at this task. And we basically said, man, how do we help leaders be more effective, no matter how gifted they are, how skilled they are, no matter how big their church is, how do we practically help them actually reach their neighbors, their town, their city, whatever it is, so. Well, yeah, and my hope is it really does help you reach yeah. more people. Yep. Mark, once again, Thank a real you, joy to go yep. deep on a project Thanks, like brother. this with you. Yep. You know, standing invitation to come back. Yep. Thank and you, sir. Uh, a lot of fun. Okay. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.